But are you tuned in to the voice of God? Are you tuned in to the voice of God? And, I, you know, I think about that. When do you really need to be tuned in to God's voice? All right. All the time, right? But I think sometimes, a lot of times, when we really tune in is when we're going through trials. Can we be honest? I think it's through trials that we get tuned in and we're saying, okay, God, what's up with this? Maybe it's when you're confused in what direction to take, when you're trying to decide what decision you need to make. What's the best decision I need to make or what direction do I need to take right now at this point in my life? Hey, you, you want to hear from God when you're leading others, okay? And whether you understand this or not, everybody in this room, you're leading someone, okay? It may not be you have a leadership position like in a church on a job somewhere, but you're leading your family, you're leading your children, okay? So you're leading someone, and we need, we need God's help. We need to hear from God. Uh, you find yourself in a crisis of, that's not your own making. I realize we bring a lot of stuff on ourselves. We do. But then there's times when you have things you face in life that's not of your own making. Matter of fact, I'm going to share with you at the end of this message a video, about a seven-minute video about just a, a, a story that happened. And it's, you may have seen it or maybe you haven't, but it, I guarantee you when I, when I heard this for the first time, tears started coming down my eyes. When I just thought about this, so I'm just kind of giving you a little teaser right now, all right, for that. But I'm going to show you something where a person found themselves in a crisis not of their own making, but how they had to listen to God. And I want to give you a scripture that talks about some of the benefits and blessings that come when you listen to the Lord. And how do we mainly listen to the Lord, right? Through this right here, right? Okay, now, these guys were living it out, and then someone, thank God, wrote it all down, all right? So that we could have this message, we could have this Bible, and Solomon uh, wrote some just amazing things. The Bible refers to Solomon as the most wisest man, the wisest man on the earth, of course, next to Jesus. And he said these things uh, here that I think will help us. We can look at this and see these are ways that God, when we tune into his voice, how God will bless and the benefits of just tuning into God. It's found in Proverbs chapter 2. It's several verses I want to read here. It starts in verse 1. It says, my son... If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with, with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Let me just stop right there. For just a moment. So he's saying, my son, it's like Solomon's talking to one of his sons and saying, if, if you want to know where to find and, and go after something that's really going to benefit you, basically what he is saying here is you're going to find it when you go after God and when you tune in to God. That's what he's saying. Verse 6 says, for the Lord gives wisdom. I mean, he needs wisdom. Come on, we all do. All right, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. Come on, you are the upright. Not because of who you are, but because of who you are in Jesus. You are a saint. Remember I preached about how you're saints of God not too long ago? You're a child of God, and God has stored things up for you to give you wisdom, to give you understanding, to give you insight. But we've got to be able to tune in to Him. He goes on to say there, he stores up, verse 7, he stores up sound wisdom for, for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Somebody ought to get excited about that a little bit. God watches over you. He watches over the way of his saints. He watches over us. Verse 9, then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity Every good path, every good path. Come on now. You can have, God can, he can be in every path that you take in life if you'll tune in to him. If you'll say, God, I want to do it your way. Let me just say, I'm going to just pause here for a second. If you hadn't figured it out now, every other way is a dead end. Okay? Hopefully we figure that out. We've got loved ones that we're praying that they'll figure it out too. Come on, we got people that we really care about that we want them to figure this out too, that finally they're going to come to the point and say, you know what, 
I've tried it. Mom and dad already told me about it or people have been trying to tell me about it. And some people just have to go through what we call the school of hard knocks, okay? And they have to discover it for themselves. But I'm saying, uh, hey, we already know that. Every other way is a, is a dead end path, but God's going to lead us on, a, uh, on a, every good path, it says. Verse 10 says, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil and from men of perverted speech. Speech. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, we were talking about in our Sunday school. And by the way, Sunday school is such an awesome thing. It really is. I would encourage you. We, we get deep in the Word when we get in the Sunday school. We're going through the book of Ephesians right now. You know what we learned today? Because it kind of applies to this right here where it just says there about how that discretion will watch over you in verse 12. It delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, people who forsake in the ways of God. And see, there's someone inside of you when you get saved called the Holy Spirit. Amen. And something he'll do for you when you get saved is he'll start changing your want-tos. Okay? He's, he's God, the Holy Spirit. He has an agenda for your life. And it's always, to like this says, lead you on every good path. All right? So when you find yourself, and listen, we are absolutely surrounded by junk in this world. It is facing us from every single direction. All right? I thought about the fish. You know, I heard this illustration one time where the guy said, you know what? It's, isn't it amazing that a fish in the ocean is absolutely just surrounded by salt water? I mean, and we've all tasted that salt water, right? And, but that fish is just, they're just they, it's their place where they have to live. But yet, if you cut into a fish, you cook a fish, you have to put a salt on it. Do you have to put salt on it? Yes, you do. Because it has no salty taste whatsoever. What's the point? Is that God can keep you in a world where you're just saturated with all the junk and the stuff of this world, but yet he can keep you pure. Amen? He can keep you clean. All right? That's amazing. God can do that. He showed us in his very creation that he can do that. So he can do that. He can keep you. He can give you, help you to use discretion. He'll watch over you uh, with understanding that he will guard you, it says there in verse 11. Verse 12 says, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. And listen, guys, you need to hear this one. Verse 16, so you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. I'm going to just hit on it for a second. All right? But guys, adultery is not just going after somebody else's wife. It's also getting on those websites. Okay? And saying, you know what? God, this is, this is my prayer always when I pray for myself when it comes to that area. I say, God, let all my passion physically be just directed toward my wife and her only. I pray that. Okay? Because guys... Ladies, you know it. Guys, you know it. We're affected by sight, okay? And this world is going to do everything they can to get you to look at some things you don't need to be looking at, okay? <laughs> I think I told you the other day I was walking. We went to the beach. Uh, I can't even remember when it was now, just, but I, I remember I was going up there. I left something in the car, and I mean, all of a sudden, this woman just comes up and uh, walks in front of me, and I just had to go just like this. And just, I, honestly, I was walking like this. I, I saw, I, I noticed they stepped to the side, and I just kind of like this. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you got to do what you got to do, okay? You don't need that. And, and, but we're, we're saturated with it. This culture that we live in today, it's like, man, the devil knows. He wants to bombard you. He wants every man to feel so rejected and so shameful and so everything that he can never be the man of God that God wants him to be. And I'm saying, guys, let's stand up in the name of Jesus. All right, let's be pure before the Lord and be pure men of God before our wives. Amen? God can help you do that. He can help you do that. All right, that's just, I'll, I'll leave it there. All right. Except for this, Joseph was a perfect example of this. 
Joseph, he was tuned into God somehow. Y'all remember the story of Joseph? He was sold into slavery by his brothers. They wanted to kill him first because they were jealous of him. But then they ended up selling him to some folks, and they took him to Egypt. He ended up in a man, an Egyptian commander's house named Potiphar. And God had blessed Joseph even in the midst of all the stuff he was going through. God blessed that young boy, that young man. All right, And, And it got to the point where Potiphar gave him just control of everything in his house. But listen to what the Bible says. We kind of get an idea that Joseph was tuned into God because of what it says in Genesis chapter 39, verses 7 through 9. It says, And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. I want you, boy. Come on now. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. He was tuned into God. Okay? That woman was throwing herself at him. All right? And I'm just saying, the devil's going to make sure that women you don't even know, okay, because they just pop up on your screen sometimes. You hear what I'm saying? Oh, my goodness. Come on, guys. You know it's true. I'm talking to our guys today. Those things will pop up there, and you've got to do something about it right then. Hey, if it's so bad, you, you need to get rid of your computer, you get rid of your computer. Whatever you've got to do, keep yourself pure before the Lord. Amen? Because, man, you, your, your family needs you. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy everything about you. And your family needs you. They need you to be the man of God to lead and direct. Now, this isn't even Father's Day, but there it is. That might have been just pre-Father's Day message right there. Let me move on. Joseph, he was betrayed. He was mistreated. He sold as a slave, accused of something he did not do. And she accused him. You remember the story? She accused him, and she grabbed at him and, and grabbed his cloak. And the Bible says he just left it. He said he just took off. That's the best thing you can do. Just take off, okay? God sees. God saw that. But Joseph had to be tuned into God for that to happen. And I just, I'm going to give you just a few keys here. I just, I'm going to call it keys to getting tuned into the voice of God, okay? I'm going to give you five quick points here. Number one is this to get tuned into God, you cannot be indifferent when it comes to the voice of God. You can't be indifferent. Um, Jeffrey and uh, showed a film. I think the youth had watched it called the uh, what was it called? Um, Play the flute. Play the flute. If you get a chance to watch this movie, it's a great little movie. But it's about a youth pastor and his, his young people, and they're just so indifferent. Okay, they just didn't care. They just didn't care about hearing from God and all this. And and that's what this scripture is talking about here in Matthew chapter 11. Jesus was talking one of the times, of the many times, but he was talking to some hard-headed, hard-hearted religious people. And in Matthew 11, 16, Jesus says this, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. And then he goes on to say this, and I'll explain this here in a second. He says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. So what is he saying here? He's saying, You guys are like people that God is trying to speak to, but you're indifferent no matter what extreme or whatever side that we try to preach or teach you, you're just not going to agree with it. You're just going to be indifferent about it, okay? That's what he was saying. He goes, we can play a flute like at a wedding, and you won't even dance. Or we can play a dirge or just some solemn, sad music at at a funeral, and you won't even mourn. I mean, you just have no reaction whatsoever, He even goes on to say, you know, you you treat John. John was one who preached repentance and fire and, you know, and and it's time to get right with God. And then, but then you say he has a demon. 
And then he says, here, here I come, and I'm eating and drinking, and, and I'm, I'm assembling, and I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to mingle among the sinners, in a sense, of trying to reach them, and you say, I'm a glutton. So in other words, nothing. You're just indifferent, okay, to the Word and to the voice of God. And I'm saying that's something we've got to be careful about. Don't get indifferent when it, comes to the, when it comes to the voice of God. You have got to make a choice, okay, whether you're going to listen or not listen to the Lord or respond to Him. Okay, every time I give an altar call, if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, you need to get in the altar. Not because I'm looking for people to get in the altar, but if God is dealing with you, you need to go talk to God. All right? And sometimes the reason we, we call it, because sometimes, you know, we'll say it that back there, but then it's almost like we say, well, I don't, if I say it back there, I don't really have to be accountable to anyone. I'm calling it to accountability. I know you're going to hear this in a lot of churches, okay? I'm calling us all to accountability. We need to be accountable to one another. We need that in our life, okay? We, we, guys, we were in our, one of our groups the other day, and we were talking about, and, uh, you know, if ever you're in a situation where you have to go somewhere on a business trip or something, and you find yourself in a hotel together, we're saying we give each other permission. You can call me up on the phone and say, hey, what you watching on TV? You hear what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about. We need to be accountable, all right? We need to have that built into us, all right? Because, you know, we're just living in a society where it's like about, well, I'll just do my thing and nobody else has to know about it. Now, I don't want to, I'm not trying to get in all your stuff. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we need each other. It helps to know that, hey, when you speak something, that someone else is saying, okay, I hear that, all right? And vice versa, it works both ways, okay? So I'm just saying we need that in our life. And when you, sometimes, you know, when, we, when I call you to the, uh, come down to the altar, it's just saying, you know what? I don't care what anyone, you just need to get to the point where you say, I don't care what, any, I'm going after God. I may not get it right. I may not get it perfect. Okay. But I'm going to go after him. All right. And I, and I, and I need my brothers and my sisters to support me. Not to look for me to mess up, but to support me. Amen. So. We can't be indifferent. We can't be indifferent. We've got to make a choice. Secondly, when it comes to tuning in to the voice of God, it, it, it takes practice and repetition. Okay? You gotta, I heard someone say it that's like this. You've got to practice the presence of God. In other words, you just, you just you feel like God's speaking to you, you need to move out and, and just, okay, I want to see if this is God speaking to me. All right, you need to practice. It's repetition, okay? You've heard it on sports teams, right? Commitment on the practice field will make all the difference on the playing field, right? It's also true of music. Our guys just got up here, and they just, you know, just halfway went through trying to get ready for, for music, okay? We would, we would sense that. We would see that, and we would re realize that, and it, the worship just wouldn't be what it is, okay? I remember going to uh, the day is, and this is not $5, because I'm not talking about her personally. I'm talking about recital uh, that, that she had. Okay, so y'all don't go tell you, oh, you, Brother Pastor Mike's got, you got $5 coming, okay? For those of you who don't know, when I, when I say, use my children illustration, I promise I'll give them $5. But I'm just talking about a recital. She just happened to be the one that was in it. All right? So anyway, <laughs> I just had to clarify that. So anyway, I was at her recital the other day. And how many have ever been to just some kind of a symphony or maybe have children that played instruments, whatever? And they, when they first get up there and they just start Everyone just starts hitting their notes and stuff. It sounds like a train wreck. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, they're not starting yet. They're just warming up. And it's like, oh, my Lord. It's like, I don't know how much more of this I can handle. All right? Because there's just something. It's just like nothing is in tune. It seems like nothing's in harmony. And it's just craziness. But then all of a sudden, the guy gets up there and taps on the thing, raises his hand and all that. And all of a sudden, then they go after him. It's like, wow, harmony. Amen? And, and, and that comes from practice. It comes from repetition, okay? It's been obvious once they do that recital that they've been practicing, and we know that's uh, repetition and things like that, and that they're, they're tuned in together, okay? What I'm trying to say is this. When it comes to hearing and tuning into God's voice, there needs to be repetition, all right? You need to keep talking to God. You need to keep staying in your word. You need to start learning the voice of the Holy Spirit as he's speaking to you, repetition okay you got to practice that 
Okay, if you feel like God is speaking to you and you feel like, well, God, this, all of a sudden you may be in a grocery store or something. All of a sudden, someone's, you just come up behind someone in line or whatever, or someone's behind you in line, and all of a sudden y'all just waiting on the person in front. And all of a sudden, you know, a, a door just opens and God all of a sudden speaks to you and said, just tell them, you know, tell them this, or I just want you to pray for them. He may, he may even tell you something. <laughs> come on now. And I know this, this takes a while of getting, he may tell you something specific, and you just go up and say something to them. And I, I, I tell you, there's times when you do that, and, and I've seen people just break down and cry. I said, how in the world? And, you just, and I'm just saying, but that's, you're practicing the presence of God. You're learning the voice of God, okay? And it, it takes practice. It takes, and, but you've got to be tuned into that, okay? Because what happens a lot of times is the, the devil will put so much on you, and just yourself, intimidation and fear, you go, ah, yeah, I don't want to make a fool of myself. You know, I don't, I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to do all this kind of stuff, you know. But I'm just saying, if you feel like it's God, that's how you learn. That's how you learn. You can practice on me if you want to. All right? Say, Brother Mike, I just feel this. And I'll tell you. I say, okay. All right? Just practice. We can practice. It's all right if we practice on each other sometimes. Is that okay? And you just tell me, well, not really. I would, you know, if you want to. But I think if you, if God will put it in your heart. You say, well, how do I know? Is this, is this there? Is this something that just kind of burns inside of you and you just can't get comfortable? I mean, you, you, you'll lead this church and all day long you'll go, oh, God, I should have said something. Come on. Come on. Amen? Exactly. What about you, Carly, a while ago? You felt, you felt, you came up to me and she said, I just feel like the Lord wants me to share this about this egg allergy that my son had. Now, if you would have went home, I already know you, Carly, because I know you. She would have went home, she goes, Brother Mike, she would have called me up on the phone. Brother Mike, God just wanted me to say something. I just didn't do it. You know? And she would have just, just, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Come on. Tell me the truth. And I'm not trying to pick on you, Carly, but God is, I, I thank God for what he's doing in that girl's life right now. Amen? Amen. And, and listen, as you, you've done this two or three times now, all right, because now you're, you're getting a little bit more comfortable doing it. Not, not, I'm not saying, you know, but you know what I'm talking about. Practicing the presence of God. Hearing from God. How many of that blessed you, by the way, that story? Amen, because that, that little boy, little, little Langston, that boy couldn't even, eggs is, are, is in everything, practically. All right? And my Lord, who doesn't want an egg, right? A boiled egg, a fried egg. Boy, I had an egg sandwich just the other day. It was awesome. But anyway, tuning into the voice of God. Y'all have to excuse my, my lapel here. It keeps sliding down here, so that's why I, I try not to mess with it too much. Let's, let's get into a third one. The third thing is this, simply take the first step. Take the first step. You all heard the story about Jesus and walking on the water and Peter coming out. I'll just read it to you real quick. Matthew chapter 14 says, In the fourth watch of the night he came to them, referring to Jesus, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So listen, they were all scared. These were fishermen. It had to be a pretty bad storm because they probably were used to being in a few storms, all right? But they were scared. But... Peter recognized his voice. Why? Because he'd been spending time with him, right? They'd been spending, living practically together, all the disciples. And he desired to come to the voice. He desired to come to Jesus, right? Yeah. And so he said, Lord, just, if it's you, just tell me to come. And Jesus said, well, come on. And I believe he just took that first step without even thinking. I mean, he was just, I think he was just captivated by the fact that Jesus is out there on the water, just walking on the water. He says, just t tell me to come, Lord. And I don't even think he even thought about it. You know, Peter was just that kind of a guy. If you read about the, the Bible, you learn about Peter, he, was just, he would just do it before he even thought. And I, I think that's what he did. He just stepped out of the boat and he just started going, you know. Now, I don't think he was just sitting there looking at his feet. I think he was just maybe, go and all of a sudden, though, of course, you know, waves started hitting him and stuff like this. 
and it began to sink. But I think, again, uh, what the point here, I didn't give you the, the, the point here, number four, uh, was, was this. Don't get distracted by other voices. Don't get distracted by other voices. And that's what Peter did. He, he, at first, he was just going after, going after the Lord, just hearing his voice. I, I, this happens, unfortunately, to a lot of Christians. When they first get saved, man, it's all about Jesus. It's all about God. I mean, it's, man, it's, man, God is just so awesome. Then after a while, what happens is other voices start speaking. Okay? Come on. You know I'm telling the truth. Other voices start speaking, and then you start getting distracted. And it could be religious voices. I'm not just talking about ungodly things. I'm talking about religious voices. You got to jump through this hoop. You got to jump through this hoop. You got to wear this certain kind of thing. You got to do this certain kind of thing. I'm just talking about all the distractions and all the other voices, and you start looking at that before you know it, you're starting to sink. And the Lord just saying, no, keep your eyes on me. Just keep your relationship with me first and foremost. Let's get tuned in to me and tune out those other voices. Okay, that is so important. And that's what happened with Peter. Jesus didn't so much, uh, you know, when he rebuked Peter, you know, and he says, oh, you have little faith. It wasn't because of his initial getting out. It's because he didn't keep his eyes on the Lord. Okay. And so I, I know Jesus, I think he was just smiling like crazy. Here, look at that boy just coming. Look at him. Look at my child. Look at here. I'm proud of you. Come on over here. You know? But all of a sudden, he, he saw Peter start going like this. Said, uh-oh. I hear Jesus now. Uh-oh. I already know what's going to happen. I, already, I see it coming. Uh-oh. Before he knew it, he started looking around, listening to other sounds, other distractions. Wind was blowing, thunder, this and that. Finally, he finally realized, I'm out here with Jesus on the water. <laughs> this ain't right. This ain't normal. Okay? And, and, but he, he started getting distracted. And I'm telling you, you can lose out on so many miracles of God. So many awesome things from God when we start getting distracted and start listening to other voices and all the circumstances around us. Okay? So don't get distracted by other voices. I love what Paul said to the Galatians in, in Galatians chapter 3. He's kind of talking about, you know, when we get fired up for Jesus, but then we start trying to do it in a different way. He said this to him, he said, how foolish can you be, Galatians 3, 3, how foolish can you be after starting your new lives in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? In other words, you started off going after God and going after him, but now it's like you're just trying to do it in your own strength. And let me tell you, folks, if God saved you, all right, this is what the Lord dropped my spirit this morning. If he brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. All right? Everybody say that. If he brought me to it, if he brought me to it, he'll bring me through it. In other words, if you start with him, you're going to finish with him. It's not in your strength or your power. You've got to keep depending on him. Get your eyes off the circumstances. Get your eyes off what everything else and everybody, other voices, and keep your focus on the word of God, the living word of God, and the written word of God. Amen. Last thing is this before I show the video. Number five, God's voice always brings peace, not fear. God's voice. We even sang that. I noticed that was in one of our songs, something about that kind of went along with this. God's voice brings peace, not fear. Let me just say this. Jesus and fear do not go together. Okay, it's like water and oil. They just don't mix. How many times did you read in your Bible where Jesus, first thing he says when he steps into a situation, it is I, be not afraid. Don't fear. That's the very first thing he says. We heard it when he was talking to, when the storm, the situation there about the storm when they were crying out. He said, it's me, don't be afraid. After his resurrection, they were locked in the upper room. They didn't know what was going to happen to them now. Jesus shows up and says, hey, it's me, don't be afraid. Okay? He says it about the very heads on your head are numbered. Therefore, don't be afraid. Come on now. Anybody know how many hairs you got on your head? You do? <laughs> Come on, Jeff. You know you still don't know. <laughs> oh, man. Nobody knows, really. But the Lord knows. That's what he's trying to say. 
Nobody knows that. Who's going to even take the time? He says, I'm so concerned about you. I know every single hair you've got on your head. Isn't that awesome? And so he says, don't be afraid. Paul, when he was facing persecution, he was facing shipwreck, the Lord appeared to him and says, don't be afraid. Because the voice of God comes with the peace of God. Or the peace of God comes with the voice of God, okay? And I love, this is one of my favorites right here. If you were, get ready to show that video. Not yet, but just be ready. But it says, my, one of my favorite verses that I saw about this, about this not being afraid and, and, and this part of this, this point, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, says this, when I saw him, this is John, who wrote, when God used to write the book of Revelation. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. Come on, I, do you, I just want that to sink in for a second. I'm the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end is what he was saying, okay? And I am the living one, the living one, not the used to be one that was living. I am the living one right now. I died and behold, I am alive. Forevermore. Come on. He gets <laughs> better. And I have the keys of death and Hades. All right? Death and hell. I've got the keys to that. So don't be afraid. So I'm saying when you get tuned into God's voice, there's always going to be some peace. There's no place for fear. Okay? When you get those reports or you get bad news or you just find yourself in a situation... Just get tuned in because when God is speaking, it's gonna be a, there's going to be peace. There's going to be, hey, I got you. I'm going to get you through. I brought you to it. I'm going to see you through it. Amen. I want, I'm going to stop for a moment. I'm going to show let you guys watch this video about seven minutes long. You guys, make sure we got volume on the computer too. Do that. <laughs> I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. And a pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. You got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane, and I looked at it. And I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front, I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up, and it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're gonna. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently, and we start climbing, and it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing and we flew probably three, four minutes and something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me, and his eyes roll back in his head. And he starts mumbling, and he passes out. Passed out cold. Now, I grabbed him, and I shook him, and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now, we we're in the clouds, flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there, and I handed him the microphone, and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, we don't know nothing. 
Tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell him that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm gonna get Anchorage emergency for you. An Anchorage emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot, and those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand, without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage, and there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die, but I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. Do you realize your head is full of voices? And everybody in this world wants to talk to you. And everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights, and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice, and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. <laughs> Finally, it all came to a stop, and the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me but they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning, a knock at my door. And I opened the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me, stay with me. 
Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. Praise the Lord. Drives the point home, doesn't it? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much.